Thank you. And uh, thank you for coming. So I got given the task of talking about how does an accessible livestock genetics, uh, livestock data platform work? And I thought that's going to be really interesting because I think I could just about go around this audience and name the, the three people who would really be interested in how it works under the hood. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into that sort of level of depth. I'm going to, uh, I guess, give you an overview of what I think are some key elements. A bit about me first. Um, uh, I'm the managing director of a company called Rezier Systems, which is a uh, agricultural software company. And uh, as you can tell from my accent, started in New Zealand, now working in New Zealand, Australia, and the United Kingdom. And we create bespoke agricultural software for organizations. Um, my speciality is livestock recording and livestock genetics, and it's where I worked for 16 years before I set up Rezier Systems. Um, but we work across a, a whole range of, of uh, agricultural um, uh, uh, industries. The business is very much built on an agricultural science background, so we're less interested in the, the flashy uh, apps. We still do those, uh, but we're much more interested in the data and how we use it from a, a research and understanding perspective. So just where we fit in, um, uh, we do some uh, work with Beef and Lamb New Zealand Genetics uh, and, and maintaining and developing database systems in those areas. We collaborate with the team from ABRI, and I think I spotted you over there, absolutely. Um, and uh, and uh, we're, we're frequently called on as uh, specialists around data standards, data interchange between agricultural organisations, and how you walk that sort of um, combination of the technical side and the inter-organisation and interperson political side as well. Um, so a data platform. As I said, I'm not going to talk about how, it's, uh, how one actually works or is put together, because if you ask the, the IT hardware guys, they'll give you a fantastic explanation of how you can build a data platform, and I don't think you want to know that. And if you ask the software guys, uh, they can give you a, a brilliant explanation of how all the moving parts fit together, and I don't think you want to know that either. But I do want to pull out some elements that I think are really important when you're talking about a, an accessible data platform. So one of the key elements is that it needs to be able to bring together data from multiple sources. And that's very much as per uh, Andrew's uh, great diagram before. You saw those clouds connected together with, with arrows, and that's a, that's a key element. A, a data platform doesn't have to store all of its data internally. It doesn't have to be the one system that everyone puts every piece of data into from the outset. It can draw together data from multiple sources, and that's really important. The second thing that I've highlighted is controlled access for data sharing. So one of the key things that we can do once we start to collect lots of data around, in our case, livestock and, and their provenance and their movements and the things that have happened to them through their lifetime and our observations on them and their carcass data at the end, is we can use it for a whole range of different activities. And Andrew talked about some of those. So we can use it for predictive analytics where we actually say what's happening based on a whole load of factors that's happening. We can use it for our genetic evaluation outcomes and we can use it to select animals. Exactly the sort of stuff that Rod was talking about. We can use it for making decisions around feeding. We can use it for making decisions around buying and selling livestock and, and a range of other things. And so we need to know and have trust in the fact that our data is looked after well, but also that it's not misused. And there were those classic cases of uh, US uh, broadacre crop cropping farmers who were very concerned that their data, it was being used for genetic evaluation, and they absolutely bought into that. That was, that was key. They were using it themselves for making decisions about on-farm. That was brilliant but they were also concerned that that data could be used against them for managing pricing, managing speculations on futures, all sorts of things. And, uh, and so controlled access and, and the confidence that 
that you as a producer, that organisations, other organisations that have measured data and captured data, whether it's genotypes or carcass data, have a say over how their data is, is used. That's really important. Um, I gave you a, a, a set of examples of of how a data platform could be used. And I, I guess, again, a key thing is that it's not one big monolithic structure that just does one core thing, or in fact that tries to do everything itself, but that it supports a variety of other applications. We want people around the industry to plug things into a data platform and do interesting stuff with it. We want those third-party software people who are busy around the, the country creating on-farm applications or in-processor applications to be able to really add value by plugging into that as well. So it needs to be able to support a variety of applications. And I think one of the key things that we're seeing is that there is the opportunity to apply some quite powerful analytics to the data. And a group of us were at the World Congress of Genetics Applied to Livestock Production last week. Uh, and we learned about deep learning. We learned about some of the other statistical methods that are being applied. And there are some amazing things that we can start to do as we apply modern computing power and, and the smart things that people have de developed over the years to, to predict and do things that actually sometimes we don't even know how the maths works. Yeah? Neural networks and all those other amazing things where yet yeah, we know how each bit of those maths work, but actually when we roll it up, we don't understand what's happening under the hood, but it's producing useful predictions and useful analysis for us. Um, it takes a while to get some confidence in that, but, but when you do, it can be very powerful. So to me, those are key elements of a data platform. Uh, I, I've done a bit of work internationally, and I've certainly engaged with some of the people in the Netherlands, and the, the Dutch centre... Uh, for technology, the Dutch Technology Centre has a range of things which it considers are essential features of what they call an open science platform. And they came to this from the, the human health perspective. But now they're, they're turning and applying it to agriculture and saying, well, actually, these same features apply. And, uh, and they list the four that you can see there, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And those words are carefully chosen because if you take the first letters, it spells FAIR, F-A-I-R. And so they talk about creating a FAIR data platform. Um, and so I'm not sure that I would use all of those exact words, but, but here's what they mean by that. So when they talk about data being findable, they mean that there are unique identifiers so that you can link data together from multiple sources. So whether that's an NLIS animal identifier or a, a PIC or, or other pieces of information that you can actually link data together. And as you get to sets of data, those sets of data also have identifiers so you can find them. Metadata that helps you to understand what piece of data this is that we're talking about. And I'll talk about that again in a moment. They would say also that data needs to be accessible, and what they mean there is that there are open protocols, easily understood protocols that you can plug together. The computer software guys and the geeks in the back room can, can make that stuff actually hook up together, and it's not closed. And it needs to have appropriate authorization, and that, that plays to the same thing that I talked about earlier. You need to have the ability for a producer or a data collector, or somebody who's been put in charge of a set of data to control access and to delegate access of that data. They talk about interoperability, and that means the, the, uh, a shared vocabulary so that when you talk about an observation that was recorded on an animal, that it's the same observation that somebody else is talking about. And you don't end up with, as we've done in the past, I've been involved in projects where people have collected data and they've said it's the same thing and we come to do an analysis on it and we can't match it up at all because it was measured in different ways. Or the, the periods between where things were, were weighed and recorded and then something else happened are totally different and the data doesn't match. So a shared vocabulary. And they talk about data being reusable and there's two things that they mean there. Is one is, if you're, you're an organization who's attempting to use some data, you need to be able to get a, a license to use that data. You need to be able to understand what that license means, wh how you can and can't use that data. Can you use it if you're a science organization but you have to give credit to the people who collected it? Can you use it but you can't use it in certain ways? That's the sort of thing it covers. 
and again metadata so that you know how data was recorded and, and, and you can actually make sense of whether it's valid or not. So I'm going to give you uh, three examples of some work that we've done uh, around data platforms and in, neither, in none of these cases would I hold them up as a perfect example of an accessible data platform. But what it does give me is it gives me a sense of, well, here's some of the problems and opportunities that we're struggling with uh, in, in those same sorts of features that, that create a, a data platform. So in New Zealand, and I think Graham Alder is here, can't see Graham, but we've been, we've been working on um, a replacement for the beef and lamb genetics database. And in New Zealand, that's traditionally been our sheep recording database, our, our equivalent of sheep genetics. Uh, it's been a very functional database, but it's been an aging database. Its technology is 15 plus years old. Um, and so we've been creating a new uh, system that's cl clearly designed as a data platform. So it's, it's meant to be the backbone for a, collecting a range of different types of data. It's designed to be multi-species from the outset. So it currently records sheep and deer, and we're starting to put milking sheep in with their different types of observations. And importantly, it brings together the, the phenotype and pedigree data that we've always recorded, but also the genotype data that was lying around in various other industry databases or in research projects. And it's got a, a bunch of core components, and I, I just want to draw attention to three of them. One is, yes, there certainly are databases, plural, that are linked together. There's an integration layer. And I don't need to say much more about it than that, but it's really important that data can flow in from laboratories, from um, data collection people, from organisations that have built on-farm software out in the field and that, that, that can just flow in, have appropriate validation applied and be, be able to be used. Uh, and, and in fact, those same integrations allow for third parties to pull out that data and use it for other presentation to farmers, other analytics for benchmarking, all those sorts of things. And finally, there are processing services which are designed to allow us to plug in different sorts of analytics and run, the, run those analyses across the data sets. And again, not very exciting stuff, but you know, we've got single step evaluations running at the moment, but there's, there's other stuff we may want to do in the future. And so by having processing services that are generalized, we can plug in different things in the future. I've also been involved with the design of a, a generic livestock data collection platform that's much more farmer focused. And again, generalized animal recording platform designed to be multi-species and consisting of lots of different parts that I've put up there. And our, our intention in that was that it was, again, it was a platform which organizations who we licensed it to could take brand as they liked, but also they could use to record a range of different things. And as we've rolled that out, and it's, it's used in the US and Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK, uh, we found that you know one of those core challenges is actually, again, it's identity. It's getting IDs for things which are really unique. And being able to, if you've got data coming from different data sources, and your IDs aren't unique, you can't hook it together. And so that's been a big learning challenge for us in that space. I've been involved with the New Zealand Farm Data Initiatives for, for uh, four years now. And, uh, and they go to the heart of those same fair principles that the Netherlands talked about. And we, I guess we probably started working on it at the same time. Uh, our work there has been funded by uh, industry through our levy bodies and, uh, and the New Zealand government. Uh, and really in three work streams, and I'll, I'll talk about those briefly. The Farm Data Code of Practice was purely designed as an initiative to get producers and other people who were helping collect data or collecting their own data about farms and producers and animals to agree on how that data was to be used. So the Farm Data Code of Practice is designed to get organisations to have clear understandable, human readable, if you like, terms and conditions. Sorry, I excluded lawyers from that. Um, so, so not just legal terms and conditions, but ones that people can understand. 
clear statement of rights around data. So we don't mind if an organization says, you own all your data that you put into our database, or whether an organization says, we own all the data that you put into the database. The important thing is that producers understand that and are able to make their choices about how they deal with the data. There's a, an accreditation process, and it's worth saying that accreditations well, there's been widespread industry buy-in to this, and 60 organisations said this is great and we want to participate and signed it off. Um, there's been much lower actual uptake of organisations getting themselves accredited and getting the logo. And that reflects what the American uh, Farm Bureau Federation has found. They've got an equivalent programme. Lots of organisations signed up to it. Very few have actually gone the last step and got themselves accredited. We're hoping that will change. Data dictionaries, I'm not going to spend any time on that, but again, getting common definitions of what you mean by a particular thing. The software guys love this because they don't have to reinvent it themselves and feel uncertain that they've got things right. And then we have a, a platform called Data Linker, and Data Linker is unusual in that it's not a database. It doesn't hold data. It's not a data hub through which information passes, but it's a set of of components, it's a framework that helps all of our organisations, be they processes, uh, science organisations, uh, producer organisations, uh, third party software vendors, it doesn't matter, they can all plug in and, uh, and make their data compatible with each other, and that's our goal. Uh, so that data does end up in the appropriate data platforms or it can be sucked in and used when it's needed. And so we have a central registry to make data findable, and that tells us who holds what types of data. It lets you find out what terms they, ho they provide that data under as well. We have a specification for how organisations get farmer permission or producer permission to share data. And actually it doesn't have to be producer permission, it might be a vet giving permission for data that they've collected to be shared as well. There are standard messages or standard bits of data that are deliberately designed to make data interoperable. And wherever we, we can, we work with international standards bodies to define those. And finally, there are data access agreements. And again, we didn't want the lawyers to have all the fun. So we, uh, we got together a small group of lawyers who defined some template data access agreements that we're strongly recommending to organisations that they pick up and use so that, again, they don't have to reinvent the wheel and, and, uh, and, and I think one of our big challenges is it's fine if you're a really large organisation who's got a lot, of, a lot of influence, but if you're a much smaller organisation, a start-up, an independent software vendor, and you're trying to get access to some data, very hard to wade through the depths of, of, of deep legal agreements. So there's a list there, I'm not going to talk about that, of the sorts of, of data that organisations are interchanging via Data Linker. And, uh, and you can see there's quite a variety. It's not all livestock data, and, uh, and it's a continuously changing list because we believe very much in a coalition of the willing. Organisations who are willing to get involved, willing to put their time where their mouths are, get a say in how we define these, these, these standards for the data. And so that's me. Thank you.